feel like I've been gone for ages. I'm sure your <laughs> colleagues who are on the trip feel that way as well. <clears throat> oh, how nice of you, Arshad. Um, two things for all of you at the top. Uh, the United States is deeply troubled by the decision today of an Egyptian court to uphold an on appeal three-year prison sentences and substantial fines for uh, Mohammed Adel, Ahmed Duma, and Ahmed Maher, three peaceful pro-democracy activists. Their continued imprisonment under a law that severely restricts the universal rights, right to peaceful assembly and expression runs counter to the Egyptian government's commitment to fostering an open electoral environment and a transition process that protects the universal rights of all Egyptians. We urge the Egyptian government to exercise its constitutional authority to commute these excessive sentences, which are not in line with the rights guaranteed in Egypt's new constitution, Egypt's international obligations, or the government's own commitment not to return to Mubarak era practices. Also, this morning, the Secretary spoke with Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, this was, uh, in part, the reason for my delay. I wanted to make sure I had the details for all of you. Uh, he conveyed to Foreign Minister Lavrov that the United States is watching events over the last 24 hours in Kharkiv, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Mariupol, Mar Mariupol with great concern and noted that these do not appear to be a spontaneous set of events. Rather, the Secretary noted the Ukrainian government's assertion that this appeared to be a carefully orchestrated campaign with Russian support. He noted in particular the recent arrests of Russian intelligence operatives working in Ukraine. He noted that Ukrainian government leaders are en route to all these cities today to try to negotiate evacuation of government buildings and a de-escalation of tensions. He called on Russia to publicly disavow the activities of separatists, saboteurs, and provocateurs, calling for de-escalation and dialogue, and called on all uh, parties to refrain from agitation in Ukraine. He made clear that any further Russian efforts to destabilize Ukraine will incur further costs for Russia, and the ministers also discussed convening direct talks within the next 10 days between Ukraine, Russia, the United States, and the EU to try to de-escalate the tensions. Uh, discussion about the right timing and agenda for that meeting will, of course, continue. Uh, he called for that, or he actually announced that that's going to happen? They discussed the that on the call. Um, so the, the details and agenda will be uh, discussed. So, it's gonna so happen, can we talk about the further about efforts? Mm -hmm. They're just so, so we can be clear, it's going to happen or they just talked about the possibility Yes, that it, that it's happen. going to happen okay. in the next Thank 10 you. days. The details in the agenda will be worked out in the coming days. Thank you. Go ahead, Lavrov. Okay, so he warned Lavrov that any further efforts to destabilize would incur further costs. Um, could you break down how you all are defining destabilize these days? Um, I believe that President Obama a couple of weeks ago said specifically that incursion into Ukraine by Russian troops mm -hmm. is what would trigger further costs. But now we're talking about these coordinated efforts in eastern Ukraine, um, troops on the border. So are these the type of things that would incur further costs, including sanctions, or are we still sticking to it would require troops uh, coming in? Well, it's never been as black and white as you laid it out. Obviously, the administration, including the president, Secretary Kerry, and senior officials are evaluating day by day uh, what steps, escalatory steps is really the broad definition, would prompt uh, responsive actions. Uh, so you're right. Yes, there have been steps taken uh, to date in response to the illegal actions Russia's taken in Crimea. Obviously, uh, the steps over the uh, last uh, 24 to 48 hours are uh, incredibly concerning uh, to the United States, and we'll be looking closely at those uh, as well. But you're at this point, um, if some of these riots in eastern Ukraine continue, are these the type of things that would incur further sanctions? Well, I don't have any sanctions to announce, but I can convey to you that these are certainly escalatory steps. So we look at these steps. Um, and uh, we take a look at these steps and, and, and discuss uh, what steps we need to take. Just to put a finer point on it, mm -hmm. um, you said that the secretary noted the comments of the um, Ukrainian government about mm -hmm. what Russia was doing to destabilize. Are you saying that because you do, these do not appear to be spontaneous mm -hmm. events, that Russia is in fact taking steps to foment this type of separatist activity? 
Well, uh, there, as you know, uh, there are these groups, uh, these individuals who uh, went into these different areas were, of course, pro-Russian separatists. Uh, there's strong evidence suggesting uh, that some of them were paid and were not local residents. Uh, so all of that um, is, uh, has raised uh, significant concerns for us as well. But certainly, given this is in Ukraine, uh, that's why he noted uh, the comments made by the government of Ukraine. What about um, reports that Russian uh, troops are now moving into um, kind of, we thought maybe they had been repositioning, but now they do seem to be um, lining up against um, part of the eastern Ukraine border, and that this kind of fits into... Putin's playbook in terms of you see all this activity by pro-Russian separatists that are claiming, um, you know, persecution by Ukraine, that this would be an instance where he would go in um, to protect them. Well, obviously we're watching this very closely, and the government of Ukraine has made comments to your point, which you may be referring to, about how this follows a similar pattern that we've seen in the past. Uh, and clearly, uh, Russian forces, uh, if Russian forces move into eastern Ukraine, either overtly or co covertly, this would be a very serious escalation. I don't have anything to confirm for all of you in terms of movements or numbers. Uh, we still are in the same place of uh, tens of thousands. Um, but uh, this is something, of course, we're watching closely, and additional intervention would, uh, would result in additional costs. I'm sorry, overt or covert movement would be escalatory, is mm -hmm. what you said? So what we're seeing now is in the view of the administration already in that phase of escalatory steps, right? Well, certainly uh, the, the fact that, um, you know, we see pro-Russian uh, separatists uh, taking these actions in a range of cities over the uh, weekend, that is, of course, concerning. In terms of the connection to troops and troop movements, I don't have anything, uh, any independent confirmation of what that will mean, but certainly we're concerned about uh, these steps. Can you say that the, um, some of these separate uh, pro-Russian separatist um, indications that they were paid and not local, mm -hmm. um, are you insinuating that they crossed the border from Russia? Are they, in fact, Russian or... Um, have they been paid by Russia? I mean, could you put a final Look, opinion? I don't have that level of detail, but let me share with you one anecdote um, that uh, I think has been in Ukrainian media but is still relevant. Uh, some, of these, uh, some of these officials, uh, separatists, uh, armed separatists, uh, went and uh, claimed they were taking over the mayor's building, and it was actually the opera house. So clearly, when you don't know what one the mayor's building is, you're probably not a local. Uh, but obviously this is something we're watching closely, and we've seen patterns in the past. Leaving aside insinuations, do you have any evidence to suggest that the events that you say do not appear to be spontaneous have been brought about by Russian citizens? I don't have more details than what I've shared with you, Arshad. Obviously this has just happened over the course of the last 24 hours, but clearly we've seen a pattern over the last couple of months. Um, these were pro-Russian uh, separatists. Um, we've expressed our concern directly, the Secretary has, and we'll continue to monitor it closely. And so we're clear, the, the reference to additional consequences, is mm -hmm. that meant to refer to all kinds of consequences or solely or predominantly economic consequences? Well, as you know, uh, and our position hasn't changed, so thank you for your question, on our, our approach is focused on political and economic uh, approaches, whether that's boosting the government of Ukraine or uh, putting in place uh, strong uh, economic sanctions. So that no, hasn't changed. It's not meant to suggest military consequences. It's not meant to, no. Thank you. I have uh, a quick uh, follow-up. Uh, so you are relying on the Ukrainian government in terms of what is going on, or, or do you have any independent sources? Well, of course, we remain very closely uh, in touch with the Ukrainian government, and uh, that's who we work closely with, and of course they are on the ground, so uh, their information is often uh, very uh, relevant and current. Okay, so when, when the Secretary talks to Mr. Lavrov, mm -hmm. did he tell him one, two, three, four, or does Mr. Lavrov in return say, look, the situation is not like this, this is what we have, this is not true, these are Russian, uh, Ukrainian citizens, and so on? Said he told him exactly what I, what I just conveyed to all of mm -hmm. you, and yeah. you can certainly reach out to the Russians for any readout from their end. Margaret? A question about the talks you referenced happening in the next mm -hmm. 10 days. Um, is that just going to be bilateral U.S. Russian meeting? Would the Ukrainians participate in that at all? Yes, you know? they would. They would be a part of it as well. So it's U.S., Russia, Ukraine in that? And EU. And EU. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what is the purpose or the intent? I mean, obviously de escalation more broadly, but mm -hmm. there had been the feeling that there was some diplomatic momentum. I mean, they 
just met face to face Lavrov and Carrie mm -hmm. a few days mm -hmm. ago. These kind of actions on the ground seem to contradict that. This window of diplomacy is still wide open. Uh, I, I would disagree with that premise. Uh, I think um, clearly when we have concerns about actions, we express them. And we've taken uh, very strong steps in response, as you've seen in the range of sanctions that we've taken in coordination with the international community. At the same time, we've consistently said that there's always an off-ramp, that we're looking for a diplomatic approach, that Russia and Ukraine need to sit at the same table uh, and discuss all of the myriad of issues uh, that they've all raised. And uh, so that would be the purpose of this. And we have a responsibility to continue to pursue that diplomatic path, even when there are concerning steps that have been taken. But the agreement to talk is not in and of itself an off-ramp. The hope is that in the course of these meetings, the Russians will change course. Sure. A, a, an off-ramp requires specific actions by the Russians. It's not just talking, but certainly talking with the Ukrainians uh, as a part of a you know mechanism of doing that would be a step that we think could be useful. So, so. if the Ukrainians are going to be there, can we assume that uh, constitutional reform is going to be a large part of that They're conversation? They're still working through, obviously, the agenda. I mean, it's important to note that constitutional reform has been underway. It's been something that the Ukrainians have strongly supported uh, and they've been moving forward on. Uh, so, but I don't want to get too ahead of the process in terms of what will specifically be on the agenda, and I'm, we can keep talking about it day by day leading up to the meeting. Jen, mm -hmm. uh, last week there were reports that the Russians pulled back a division. This information turned out to be wrong. Uh, you know, those. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, we, we saw those reports too. Uh, I don't have any update on you uh, uh, for that, uh, on that for you. Sorry, that was a tongue twister. Uh, do we have more on Ukraine? Ukraine? Uh, no, so Secretary Kerry, did Secretary Kerry talk to uh, uh, Minister Lavrov uh, about Syria, about Geneva 3 this time? Uh, this meeting, this phone call, I should say, was really focused on Ukraine. Um, but he, when he met with him uh, last Monday, uh, it was only a week ago, uh, they did talk about Syria and did talk about the need to continue to move forward with uh, the removal of chemical weapons. And, uh, and the secretary expressed his uh, ongoing concerns about the brutality of the Assad regime. So they talked about that just a week ago. And so Sorry, the, the, the opposition is, uh, the Syrian opposition is uh, Can we just finish Ukraine and then we can go to you on Syria next? Do we have any, Ukraine? Go ahead. clarify one last sure. thing. Sure. Um, I'm sure you said this, but just all four parties to this four-way talk have agreed to, to do this. This. Uh, you Correct. know, let me let me check on that for you. Obviously, okay. uh, it's something that, that the Secretary has spoken with Foreign Minister Lavrov about it. I'm fairly certain he's spoken with the Ukrainians about it. We've been uh, communicating with them uh, constantly, uh, but in terms of whether all are confirmed, let me check on that and just make sure. The, the Russians will be there. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have yeah, any I'm more? Uh, one moment, yeah. Tate. Yeah. Ukraine in the back? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, my name is Barbara Platt Usher. I'm just introducing myself because I have been here before. I'm oh, great. Welcome. In for I like the red Gattis. blazer. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, there have been some reported comments from the Sur uh, Russian, from the Russian Foreign Ministry in response to the activity of the past 24 hours, quoting Lavrov, that the need is for federalization and that Ukraine needs international assistance to help carry out such constitutional reform. Does that reinforce your concerns about this being a harbinger of Russian intervention? Well, uh, federalization is an issue that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov has consistently raised, uh, whether it's publicly or privately. So it's not a new issue for carrying out constitution. That's, how he, that's what he said uh, mm -hmm. just a few hours ago, that to, to carry out this constitutional reform, Ukraine would need international assistance, which then makes one wonder what sort of assistance the Russians have in mind. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure actually what that means. Uh, the constitutional reform process has been underway, and the Ukrainian government has been uh, very supportive of it, and they've been uh, they've been implementing it. So I'm not sure, uh, I'd probably need a little more clarification on what they're referring to. In terms of their claims or their calls for federalization, uh, you know, this is an issue where uh, we feel the Ukrainian government, uh, the legitimate government of Ukraine needs to be at the table to discuss any issues, whether it's autonomy uh, or any way, uh, any ways that the, uh, the, the, the country would be governed moving forward. But I don't have any clarity on what they mean by international assistance, so I can check with our team and see if they've heard that as well. Lavrov seems to be receptive to all the meetings, but on the other hand, Russia seems to be consolidating its position. Is that, do you see that, like a duplicity there in their actions? 
Uh, well, Said, uh, look, obviously there are steps that Russia has taken that have raised significant concerns, which is why we have taken our own responsive steps uh, to, to their actions. So that hasn't changed on our part either. But you can have processes happening at the same time, and that's what we're talking about here. I guess my, my point is the following. He goes to all these meetings. He will go to this for a uh, party meeting and so on. But in the meantime, the Russians seem to be consolidating their position. What is hope to, uh, to achieve, uh, you know, uh, through these meetings? Uh, well, Said, I mean, obviously we'd like to see uh, an end to this conflict. And we've put in place a range of sanctions uh, at the same time. Uh, while we've been having these conversations, uh, those have had a significant impact. Uh, the World Bank uh, has warned that Russia's economy could shrink by 1.8 percent this year, even without additional economic sanctions. The Russian currency has experienced sharp volatility between March 3rd and April 7th. The Central Bank of Russia spent $25.8 billion to prop up the ruble. Uh, all of these are specific uh, impacts that we're seeing in the Russian economy. And whether, regardless of what they say, there's no question that that's having a uh, substantive impact. Do we have more on Ukraine? Yeah, or? Just follow up on that. Okay. Um, we also saw reports over the weekend that the, that some in key sectors of the Russian economy have taken steps to insulate themselves from transactions in foreign currencies like dollars and euros. But mm -hmm. are, you, are you taking that as a sign that they're somehow like hunkering down for a further round of sanctions that could be triggered by military action? I'm not sure why they've taken those specific steps, and I don't even have any confirmation of that. Um, obviously, we've been very clear that if they continue to take escalatory steps, uh, then we are open to taking additional sanction steps. And the executive order the president signed uh, gives us broad authority uh, and flexibility to uh, sanction industries. And so, uh, you know, again, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't uh, calculate for you why they're taking certain steps, but we haven't made a secret about our willingness to take additional steps if they do. Uh, more in Ukraine or Syria? You want to go to Syria? Yeah. Okay. Uh the Syrian opposition has received the confirmations that Geneva 3 will be convening soon. Do you have anything on this? Uh, I'm not sure what that would be referring to. Obviously, we're in, remain in close touch with the opposition. Our new envoy, of course, was meeting with them over the course of the last two weeks. I think he's back in Washington. Uh, we're in close touch with the opposition. Uh, we're in close touch with uh, spe Joint Special Representative Brahimi and, of course, our, our European uh, and international counterparts. But uh, again, uh, the Geneva conference has been on hiatus. I've not heard anything to indicate that that has changed. And how do you think Geneva 3 will be different than Geneva 2 if uh, it would be held soon? Well, again, uh, you know, the purpose of, uh, of this process, I should say, has been to convene the opposition and the regime uh, to have a discussion about creating a transitional governing body. But again, I haven't heard uh, reports uh, or, or details of, of what you're referring to. What are you doing in terms of uh, certain opposition groups that you may be working with to counterbalance apparently the spread of extremism and so on to the point where Russian President Putin said today uh, that those who are trained in, in Syria can find their way to Russia, and he is expressing concern that many of your allies are well, arms. I money. haven't seen his specific comment, Said, but I will say that um, we've expressed the same concerns about the growth of extremism. Uh, we've uh, that's why we've taken several steps to make sure assistance is provided through the moderate opposition. Uh, so we also have concerns about the growth of extremists, and that's something that the secretary speaks about uh, regularly. Um, with uh, with his allies around the world. I will note, and I'm, I can't imagine this is what you're referring to, but just to be clear, the um, uh, the SOC General Assembly uh, is going to be taking place in Turkey soon. I'm not sure if that's... It will be done today, the meeting. Yes, okay. So I don't know if that would be uh, confused uh, with that. But, uh, you know, again, uh, as Joint Special Representative Brahimi has said, uh, you know, they had to go on hiatus because of a lack of progress, a lap lack of opening to uh, moving things forward on the decided agenda. So uh, there's no news that I've heard to so, reconvene at this moment. Jen, would you say that Mr. Jarba remains your primary interlocutor? Uh, well, there are a range of officials, Saeed, that we uh, rely on as interlocutors. And, and obviously, when, uh, when our new uh, special envoy was there, he met with a range of officials as well. So. Okay, because there, there are reports that the, what they call the internal opposition like Aplazim and others mm -hmm. and so on, in the capital city of Damascus. They, they are completely, you know, they, you are not in touch with them in, in any capacity. Could you confirm or that you Again, are, I think not? the fact that our, our new special envoy was just on the ground in Turkey meeting with a range of 
officials from the opposition speaks to that. Do we have more in Syria? Syria. Okay. Uh, today in Israeli press, uh, there were reports that uh, there were two chemical weapon attacks mm -hmm. uh, in around Damascus, in Harastan, in Eastern Ghouta, uh, that happened two weeks ago. Do, do you have any comment on that? I've certainly seen those reports. Um, we're not in a position to confirm or corroborate uh, those reports, and we take every allegation uh, or report seriously, and we'll certainly look into it. I'm just curious if uh, these allegations were to be true. Uh, was the red line or is the red line still there? I mean, would this trigger any kind of military? Well, again, I'm not going to speculate on that because we don't have any information to corroborate the reports. Uh, today, uh, oh, yesterday, uh, her, there, there was an article uh, written by uh, Simon Hirsch, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the uh, main uh, allegations uh, in the piece that Turkey, uh, Turkish intelligence was behind of the 21st August of chemical attacks in, in Damascus. Do you have any comment on that? White House already denied that. Uh, I know they did, and I would just echo what they said. Um, you know, we stand by uh, our own reports, our own intel gathering, uh, the view uh, of the international community that was rides widespread, that this is, uh, there's no question that this was, these attacks last August 21st were done by the Syrian regime. Sure. Uh, one more on Any okay. reaction to the assassination of uh, Father Francis van der Lugt in Homs today? Sure, I do have that one moment. <clears throat> uh, we are saddened by the news that Father Francis van der Lugt has been killed by a gunman in Homs. We condemn this violent attack and all attacks against innocent civilians and minority communities. As we have said throughout this conflict, we deplore continued threats against Christians in Syria, and we reiterate that we stand on the side of the Syrian people who are fighting for a Syria that is inclusive and pluralistic and respects all faiths. We commend Father Vanderloot for his support of the Syrian people and the Christian community throughout his life, and especially in the past three years of conflict. Uh, and for example, uh, he repeatedly advocated for the people of Homs when they were being starved by the regime and worked to mitigate the immense suffering in the city. Middle East peace. Yep. Um, so this morning in your statement, you said that last night's uh, three-way meeting was serious and constructive. Mm -hmm. How so? Uh, well, I'm not going to outline it further, uh, but that was uh, the evaluation of the parties and by uh, our uh, facilitators who participated in the meeting. Uh, they also uh, agreed to reconvene today. So they'll be reconvening today uh, to continue this effort and, and these discussions. Has that happened yet, the reconvening? Uh, I'd have to check with our team. Obviously, there's a time change issue, so I would suspect it's, uh, it's happening soon, if not already. And that will be Ambassador Indyk plus the lead negotiators, Zippy mm -hmm. Livni and Erica. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are there now any plans for Ambassador Indyk to return to the United States for consultations or to, to do briefings? Well, again, we, uh, we have discussions. The Secretary has discussions with Ambassador Indyk and with the parties uh, every single day. and evaluates what is most useful and productive. At this point, he'll still be in the region and we'll make a, a decision day by day. And are you giving any thought, this is something that came up last week, mm -hmm. to mitigating the uh, potential negative consequences of a collapse in the talks? When you're reevaluating, as the Secretary said on Friday, mm -hmm. are you looking at what you could, would, should perhaps do if your reevaluation comes to the conclusion that uh, this is not a fruitful course to pursue. In what capacity do you mean? Well, you know, there are a lot of potential negative costs from a collapse in the mm -hmm. ne negotiations, right? I mean, 2014 is real different from 2000, mm -hmm. but there was a significant eruption of violence. Um, the main negotiating partner is the Palestinian Authority, which really only controls to some degree the West Bank, mm -hmm. but not Gaza. So there are potential negative consequences if Hamas decides to up its rocket attacks or other things. There, it would strike me that if you're reevaluating, you're probably thinking about what you can do to try to tamp down the effects of a collapse. Um, but perhaps you're not, which is why I'm asking well, our the question. Focus are, at this point, our shot is really on evaluating 
uh, where we are and where we might go and what's possible in that capacity. So, uh, of course, as we've said uh, many times, it's up to the parties and they need to determine whether they're going to take steps that will allow this process to continue. So that's really the focus of our discussion. So you're not at a point where looking at negative consequences to their collapse is something that's high on your agenda? We're focused on determining whether these uh, the process can move forward. Are you convinced that the parties are not just kind of running out the clock and allowing, you know, committing to talking through the end of the month through the deadline, but not really engaging meaningfully to make progress? I mean, there have been some comments by officials on both sides saying, well, you know, we've committed to the end of the month, but after that we're free to do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is, is, are you still at the point where you think you might be able to get some kind of extension or some kind of you know, if not framework agreement, then some agreement which can keep this going, or are they just kind of humoring you at this point? Yeah, look, the talks are ongoing. Um, the parties have indicated themselves, the negotiators, I should say, have indicated themselves that they want them to continue. Obviously, that needs to be an agreement that the parties make, um, and we can't make those decisions for them. Uh, so uh, because I would point you to the public statements of a number of the actual negotiators. There are certainly people on both sides um, who don't support a peace effort and have never supported a peace effort. Uh, but uh, those who have been closely engaged have uh, not indicated to us that they want to end this process or end the negotiation. And they've spent several hours together over the past several days. So that's an indication of, of their seriousness. Yeah. You know, those who are negotiating <laughs> with one another are basically at each other's throats. I mean, live me in and Sai Barakat are calling each other names and so on, and threatening each other, you know, so, uh, and in fact, in response to your statement today, the Palestinian denied that it was constructive and, uh, in, in, uh, uh, or, produ or serious, as you said, because it seems that everybody was sort of uh, entrenched in their own position. Well, Said, uh, these are tough issues, uh, and there are tough decisions that need to be made, um, and uh, you know, again, it's up to the parties to decide whether they want to make them. So uh, obviously our view is that uh, there are many positive benefits of uh, moving forward, continuing to move forward on a peace process, and we're pursuing that now. But it's going to be up to the parties to take the steps that are necessary. So would you say that we are getting to a point where you're going to say we, are, we cannot want it more than the parties do? Are we at that point yet? Well, I think if you, I would point you to what the Secretary said on Friday. Uh, we have a big agenda, uh, whether that's uh, addressing the events in Ukraine or uh, the ongoing uh, process with Iran and the P5 plus one or the crisis in Syria. Uh, and I could go on and on. And certainly we see uh, incredible benefits of a positive outcome of a peace process, but the parties have to want to pursue that. They have to want to take the necessary steps, and, and that's what we're discussing with them now. And, and my last question tomorrow, uh, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Mr. Lieberman, will be in town mm -hmm. visiting. Uh, do you expect like a Palestinian counterpart to come also and meet with you uh, anytime soon? Well, uh, Foreign Minister Lieberman is the Secretary's counterpart, as right. you know, um, so he'll be here tomorrow, as you mentioned. I don't have any uh, meetings with the Palestinians to uh, announce for you at this point. And he, Oh, go ahead. Uh, has the, the secretary uh, discussed the peace process with the president since he came uh, back? Uh, the secretary is still in Boston, so um, he has been uh, certainly in touch uh, with the White House over the weekend and has been working closely as we have at every point in this process. But uh, he's been in Boston since we ended the trip on Friday. Is he planning to go back to the region or he's done? Uh, I don't have any plans to announce for you at this point. We'll certainly evaluate day by day. He's been in touch with the White House, but has he talked to the President about this? I'm not going to confirm details of who he's talked to. I can just convey that he's, con he's communicated with, uh, you know, the national security team, and there's a range of officials involved in that, and I expect that will continue, and has been the case for months through the course of this process. Someone We're still looking at an April 29th deadline for this process, correct? Uh, that hasn't changed. Obviously, we're discussing with the parties what's possible at this okay. point. And you possible saw... About, sorry, possible about an extension, you mean? Well, that's have been part of the discussion, but obviously there are a range of issues that are being discussed now, so... And you saw the news out of Ramallah today, I'm sure, with one of the negotiators saying that he was preparing more steps, signing more treaties towards mm -hmm. statehood. Um, how does the U.S. square those actions against the negotiators saying that they want to continue these talks? Well, uh, both parties have taken unhelpful steps. Uh, there's no question about that. 
Um, and uh, there are a range of politics that are at play here as well. But both parties have also indicated uh, that they want to see if there's a path forward. So that's what we're discussing. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, things have been uh, challenging over the past several days, but, but we're going to continue to discuss with the parties as long as we feel that they are uh, interested in pursuing a path forward. But how can they, how can they be either side really be taken credibly in saying they want to continue the talks or they're interested in a path forward when both sides have taken these unhelpful steps? Well, both sides have taken unhelpful steps, yes. And both sides have indicated they don't want to end the conversation. So all of these issues are being discussed in the meetings. But, I mean, but just to follow up on Laura's point, mm -hmm. it's one thing to sit in a room and say you want to continue talking. Mm -hmm. It's another um, totally different thing, as you've said all along. Sure that actions speak louder than words, mm -hmm. and, her and their actions are certainly not creating a climate that's inducive to either A, these talks to, uh, continue, and B, making progress on the talks. Well, I think both parties, it's between them. They need to determine whether they both want to pursue a longer-term path forward. So yes, there were actions that were announced last week that were unhelpful. Some of them are being implemented now. But again, both parties are meeting again this evening, and we'll see where we land. The secretary said last week, we're not going to sit here indefinitely. Like, he's not going to mm -hmm. continue to put all his effort in if the parties are going to continue to take steps that are antithetical to wanting to produce an agreement. So what time, at what point do you take them not at their word or their fact that they're sitting in a room with you, and you take them on their actions, which are clearly, as you say, unhelpful? Well, again, some of the steps you're talking about are steps they announced last week. Obviously, we've been engaged with discussions with them since then, and we'll make an evaluation day by day. But they're talking today out of Ramallah about taking mm -hmm. additional steps. And I guess the question is, to follow on Elisa's, you know, they can say that they want to continue talks, and they can also at the same time take these unhelpful steps. Mm -hmm. And at what point does that end? Do you just say, you can't do both, it's either one or the other? Well, those are conversations we're having with the parties. So I have nothing more to lay out for you in terms of what the details of that is. But uh, we're continuing to convey with them, to communicate with them about uh, the, the process moving forward. And, and as the Secretary said, uh, we're not in this forever, but we certainly see a positive benefit of continuing the process if, uh, if we think we have viable partners. But the bottom line is they won't be able to do both um, in Forever, right? I mean, they're going to have to decide one avenue of action or the other. They can't. Well, well certainly the parties would need to determine uh, how, what the conditions would be for moving the process forward. Jim, I want to be able to get you to comment on an idea that is being floated around town. It's called 431, and it's uh, the, the 30 prisoners that were supposed to be released on the 29th, plus an additional 400 Palestinian prisoners that is, you know, recent prisoners, plus Jonathan Pollard. Could you comment on this idea? I'm not going to speak to that, Saeed, no. Yeah, um, Go ahead. Are there immediate or measurable consequences for the expiration of the talks on, on the 29th? Like, in other words, is there any tie to aid, any tie of sweeteners, things that change the climate beyond, of course, not having peace? From the United States the United standpoint? States. No, not that I'm aware of, no. So none of the um, incentives or anything that was laid out at the start of the talks will fall away? In what capacity? There were a number of um, uh, goals beyond peace, things that were working with the to be Palestinian economic economy, development, exactly. Mm -hmm. Other things. Well, a lot of those steps were tied to a, a final status agreement right. in terms of their ability to be successful. So um, I can't do an evaluation case by case. Obviously, we still uh, want the Palestinian economy to be successful. I'm not going to get ahead of where we are because we're working to see what the path forward is. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, some of those steps would be contingent upon a, a, a successful peace agreement where two parties are living side by side. But yeah. some of those, um, I'm using the term sweeteners because I don't really know what else to call them, mm -hmm. incentives. Um, were they tied to the fourth stage of prisoner release and things like that? I mean, there were actions met by incentives. I'm not sure what you're referring to specifically. It wasn't just final status as in, like, peace for all eternity. It was sort of like, if we get this far, there's a reason to keep continuing to go forward. And that there might or might not be something on the table before April 29th that would keep people in the room and negotiating. Well, that was always going to be uh, some steps that the parties were going to take mm -hmm. that would create a condition and a climate 
uh, for moving the peace process forward, uh, whether that was a framework or whether that was an extension with certain conditions. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of U.S. sweeteners. So there's no aid that no longer becomes accessible for the no, Israelis we provide, the Palestinians? No, we provide, obviously, Israel uh, having... Uh, a secure Israel is hugely important to the United States strategically. Um, we provide, of course, aid to the Palestinian Authority as well. Um, beyond that, I'm not going to speculate on what may or may not happen, given our focus is on, uh, on, on seeing if there's a process Jim, forward. Jim, you're in his hearing tomorrow, I guess. It is tomorrow? Uh, the uh, Secretary's uh, hearing? Is sure. Okay, mm -hmm. and he will be meeting with uh, Congresswoman Kate Granger, you know, the chairman, chairwoman of the Appropriations uh, Committee. She'll be will in he, the he, hearing, he invite, I suspect. Huh? She'll be in the hearing, you mean? She'll be uh, attending I, the I hearing? I guess he isn't he meeting with, the, with, the, with them. I mean, okay, let me ask you the question. Will he raise, uh, will he advise against cutting off aid to the Palestinian Authority? Uh, we've never advised to. So I'm, I'm again, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to what the steps, uh, what questions are raised tomorrow, and I'm not going to get ahead of that process. Do we have more on the peace process? Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. What would the U.S. role be in the upcoming days till the end of, uh, of uh, April? Uh, well, Ambassador Indic is on the ground. Uh, the parties have agreed to uh, reconvene today, so that will be happening shortly if it's not already happening. And we'll continue to be in close touch with both the parties, uh, the leaders, uh, as well as the negotiators on the ground, and we'll evaluate what the appropriate role is to play. And one more. Uh, how does the Secretary feel about the process uh, after months of uh, meetings and travels and uh, negotiation, negotiations are uh, collapsing now? Uh, well, again, uh, you know, the, the negotiations, the talks are ongoing. Certainly there have been unhelpful steps taken over the past week, but uh, we remain engaged with the parties. The Secretary is um, clear-eyed and focused on the path ahead, and uh, he remains in close touch with the parties, with the negotiators, um, with our uh, interagency here, and uh, we'll make a determination about, about uh, what can happen moving forward. Will we consider what happened last week? A person will sit back. Certainly not. It's never been about the secretary. It's been about the future of the Israeli and Palestinian people. Uh, and uh, that's what he's always felt and why he remains committed to seeing if there's a path Does he forward. Do you need to see a certain amount of progress or any, are there any benchmarks that would um, prompt his return or is there something he wants to see before he wants to go back um, yet again? I mean, nothing that I'm going to outline here. Obviously, part of it is discussing with Ambassador Indic, with the negotiators, with the parties, and seeing what would be most useful moving forward. Do you think, um, because the Secretary has traveled there so much, mm -hmm. um, that perhaps like the parties um, have gotten so used to him going that you know it doesn't give them, because they know that he'll keep returning and stuff, it doesn't kind of give them the incentive to work hard enough to try and reach a deal that they know that he'll, that he'll always be back? I mean, is there well, it, it a strategy always, now to kind of hold back his he's only been the there, prestige of... He's, only, he's been there, 14, what, like about 14 times? Once in the last again. three months, though. Um, is, and that a, is that a conscious choice to kind of not... Well, it, it was the stage in the process we were in, and he's been in, very engaged uh, over phone, over video conference with uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, and President Abbas, and uh, you know he'll make an evaluation. We'll all make an evaluation together with the negotiating team on whether it makes sense for him to return to the region. Did he receive an apology from uh, the Israeli Defense Minister? Did he? Yeah, receive any apology? I don't have any update on that. That seems like it's very old at this point, but you forget about it. That means you forgot no, I don't have any update for you on that. I wanted to ask you whether mm -hmm. you feel that perhaps like Lara or, or mm -hmm. Elise was saying, that both sides, in essence, take you for granted and they're just running out the clock. I mean, they don't want, they don't want to get on your bad side, so they keep, they keep meeting with each other. And then, you know, when the time comes, it's over. Well, Saeed, uh, look, I think uh, there are a lot of discussions that happen behind the scenes that we're not going to talk about publicly. And um, that will continue. Uh, we'll make an evaluation as to what our level of engagement should be moving forward, but I don't have anything to lay out for you today. Will you take them to the woodshed at one point? To the what? I mean, will you so To the orchard? Woodshed. <laughs> woodshed. I woodshed. Said. woodshed. <laughs> said the orchard. Yeah. I, said. I, mean, it's an old I don't know. I mean, that would, would be you, odd. Would you chastise them publicly at one point? Look, this is not about blame. This has been about... Uh, about uh, what's in the best interest of the Israeli and Palestinian people. And that's why we've been hopeful about both parties making tough choices. Uh, so we'll keep working on it day to day. Uh, any more on this topic or moving Middle East peace? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. 
uh, as a 29 approaching, do you or do you intend to convey a message to the party like, hey guys, uh, we 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 we're here now. Uh, we did our best. If you need us, you know our number. As Jim Baker said one time, you can call us. Are you going this way? Uh, I'm familiar with that uh, anecdote, uh, but. Uh, look, I would point you to what the secretary said on Friday. I think he was pretty clear. We remain engaged with the parties uh, every single day. Our negotiators are on the ground. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have any predictions for you. After 29? Even after Again, 29? Again, I don't have any predictions for you. Um, if I – can we move on? Sure. Um, or do we have any more Middle East peace? No? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I want to ask you on uh, Secretary Kerry's uh, upcoming visit to Azerbaijan and Georgia. Um, what can you tell us? When is it happening? Um, I, I don't have any trip or schedule to announce for you, so I'm not aware that that trip has been uh, planned in any It's been capacity. announced in Azerbaijan by U.S. Ambassador Morningstar that mm -hmm. the Secretary Kerry will be traveling to Azerbaijan and Georgia. So well, I'm sure uh, he would like to go, but I don't have any details for you on, on when or uh, if that trip will happen. But it will, he will be traveling just to Azerbaijan, Georgia, but not, uh, not Armenia? I don't have any details about any trip to Azerbaijan or Georgia to outline for you. Right. But is it is it uh, happening? Is it something that's been planned, or is it happening because of Ukraine? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, again, uh, there's many places that he would like to visit, including Azerbaijan and Georgia. But I don't have any uh, details or, or uh, trip plans to announce for all of you. Uh, Turkey. Turkey. Okay. Uh, it has been over a week that the local elections uh, conducted in Turkey. Is there any way you can uh, tell us this, uh, uh, that? Uh, whether you find the elections uh, done in a transparent and uh, fair and free uh, condition circumstances? Uh, you know, I'm certainly aware. We are certainly aware of the uh, elections that have taken place. I don't have any uh, particular analysis for you about um, the outcome of the elections. Okay. Pan election? Uh, well, the secretary uh, provided put out a statement uh, over the weekend, so I'd point you to that. I have just one more question mm -hmm. on Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Twitter ban uh, was lifted by mm -hmm. the Constitution Court, and today uh, the Deputy Prime Minister said that that decision was wrong by the Constitution Court, and it was supposed to respect the uh, other local Turkish court's decisions about the privacy and individuals, individual rights. Uh, I was wondering whether you think the Constitutional Court uh, didn't respect the uh, privacy and... Well, I'm not going to engage in Turkish politics, but I will say uh, we welcome, of course, the recent Constitutional Court decision in support of freedom of expression in Turkey. We note the Turkish <laughs> government implemented the ruling to unblock Twitter yesterday. Uh, we are also following the Ankara Court's decision that the government should unblock access to YouTube. Uh, and we continue to urge the Turkish government to ensure all open access uh, to all social media. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Licenses to Boeing and GE to sell engines and things to Iran, are those the types of deals that you envisioned when the agreement went into effect in January? I'm not sure what you're referring to. The, on Friday, I guess, it mm -hmm. was announced by Treasury that they had granted these licenses mm -hmm. to GE and to Boeing. Is that the, are those the types of economic things that the State Department would consider a good thing? Boeing makes a sale, pl Iranian plane travelers are safer. Uh, is that the type of thing that I don't have any particular envision? comment on this. Obviously, we work closely with the Treasury Department, but I would point you to them for any analysis. It was specifically contemplated in the Joint Plan of Action, mm -hmm. the sale of spare parts and other aircraft materials. So okay. it was there so, from the beginning. There you go. Is this something the state should crow about, though? You've, it's a deal for American companies, you safer train or plane travelers, and I'll see if there's anything we, else we'd like to provide. Okay. Okay, yeah. Scott. Iran. Uh, okay, Iran, go ahead. Yeah. And Any then we'll update on Vienna negotiation? Uh, well, I know that uh, a, an extensive background briefing was done uh, in advance of the trip, so I would point you to that, which I believe we sent out. Uh, broadly, let me just give you a few logistical updates. Um, there is an internal P5 plus 1 meeting uh, tonight. Uh, Foreign Minister Zarif and EU High Representative Ashton uh, have their, uh, their typical dinner that they do around every 
uh, every set of meetings. Uh, there will be plenary sessions tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, as, as was stated in the briefing, but let me reiterate, uh, we're certainly clear-eyed about the challenges ahead uh, and determined to keep making progress on different issues. Uh, as you all know, the experts have been meeting over recent weeks um, in Vienna, uh, and we know uh, we're starting, we know where uh, we can see points of agreement, and we know uh, where gaps have to be bridged. So our team will be on the ground for the next couple of days, and I expect they'll do another uh, briefing as it concludes. Are you satisfied so far? Uh, well, I think we've uh, spoken to, uh, and not just us, but others have spoken to, uh, the fact that Iran has abided by the JPOA. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, our technical experts and our negotiating team are on the ground doing that. Uh, go ahead in the back. Uh, Cyprus. Cyprus. Uh, the mm -hmm. Greek Cypriot uh, negotiator was in town last week. Do you ever read out of his meetings at the State Department? Uh, sure, I believe I do. Um, <coughs> Deputy Secretary Burns uh, met with Greek Cypriot negotiator Andreas Mavroyanis uh, on April 3rd to discuss Cyprus settlement efforts. The meeting is part of periodic consultations the department conducts with all parties involved in the Cyprus talks. We reaffirm our full support for the Cypriot-led process under the auspices of the United Nations Good Offices mission to reach a comprehensive statement. We continue to urge both sides to make real and substantial progress toward reuni reunifying the island as a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. Do you believe both sides are showing the flexibility that's necessary to move the process forward? Uh, we do. We've been met with both parties. Uh, we're continuing to urge uh, both parties to seize the timely opportunity to make real and substantial progress. Uh, and this is, again, an ongoing process. Same issue. Same issue. Yes. Okay. The last week, the secretary met with the foreign minister of Turkey, as you know. Mm -hmm. You were there. They discussed Cyprus according to the Turkish foreign minister. Can you give us a readout of this meeting? I, I really don't have any additional readout. Uh, obviously, it's an issue that's on the secretary's mind and on the foreign minister's mind, and certainly they discussed uh, ongoing uh, efforts. I think also Eric Rubin, uh, as the secretary, is going to go to the region next week. Do you have any read that? On I'm happy to check on that. He's going to where? He's going to Cyprus? I, I believe so, yes. Okay, let me check on that. I'm, I'm seeing a nod behind you, so I'll take that as a, as a likely yes. But yeah, we, can, we can get that around. There's a lot of phone of friends going on here today. It's good. Um, go ahead, Scott. The secretary meets with the South Sudanese foreign minister this week while you were traveling. There was an announcement of sanctions in mm -hmm. uh, South Sudan. Have there been any individuals associated with those sanctions, and is the message that part of the message to the South Sudanese foreign minister this week? Uh, I'm certain that will be part of the discussion. I'm not aware of individuals tied to it but yet, but let me talk to our team and see if there's an update. I know that was last week, if I remember correctly. Go ahead, Arsha. As if you were asked this while I was not around, mm -hmm. have you been asked about the BJP's uh, political platform? I have not been. Okay. <clears throat> so as you, I'm sure, know, the uh, BJP party in India in its uh, political platform says that they are going to study, revise, and update their nuclear yeah. policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I realize that's an internal political document by one party in an election, mm -hmm. but it's a comment that also uh, – raises questions about whether they may abandon their uh, no first use policy on nuclear weapons um, should they come to power. Um, does the U.S. government believe that uh, it is better for the government of India to maintain its current no first use pledge on nuclear weapons? Well, our position on this hasn't changed. Uh, we, of course, as you laid out there for us, are not going to comment on a platform of a party uh, running for uh, office on ongoing elections, uh, but nothing has changed about our view. And But is it indeed your view that you think it's better for the Indian government to have a no first use policy? Uh, I don't have anything more specific for you, Arshad. I can check with our team and see if there's more we want to lay out on this. Can you tell us one more time what's your view on this? Again, I'm not, I'm not going to outline it further. Uh, obviously, these are discussions we have with the Indian government. I will check and see if there's more our team would like to also say. Sure. Um, I understand that um, Representative Peter King and Chuck Schumer also, uh, both reached out to the Secretary about the arrest of a New York police, uh, off-duty police officer who had some stray bullets. And I know you last week have um, 
acknowledge the arrest, but now the NYPD says it's working with the State Department. Mm -hmm. And if you can uh, bring us up to date on the... Uh, I don't have much more to offer you. Uh, we don't have a Privacy Act waiver. Uh, we are aware, of course, of reports of the citizen you mentioned uh, who has been arrested in uh, New Delhi, India. Uh, we take our obligations, of course, to assist U.S. citizens uh, overseas very uh, very seriously, uh, but we don't have any other additional update at when this point. You, well, but you confirmed the arrest of a citizen last week, and mm -hmm. now you're saying, are, are you saying that that citizen is one and the same of the citizen that was arrested? And can you confirm that... Um, Representative King, who has published the letter, mm -hmm. that you've received the letter? I can check on the letter. Um, I didn't receive an update on that uh, internally. I know we were looking into it, but um, beyond that, I, I just don't have any more updates for all of you since last week. Uh, do you agree with the assessment of Congressman King that uh, arrest of this particular New York police official was in retaliation of uh, the arrest of Indian diplomat Devyani Kogagad? Again, I'm not going to speculate on it, given I can't even speak to the identity of the individual. Telling you the same thing. Uh, understood. I can't speak to the identity of the individual, so I'm not going to speculate on that. Can you talk more? Sure. Uh, on Cuba, the mm -hmm. USAID program mm -hmm. to create a Twitter feed for Cubans. It was said last week that the program was not covert or classified. Mm -hmm. Do you know if any parts of it were classified that, or that would require members of Congress to be briefed in a skiff about it? Um, I'm not aware of, uh, of it being classified in any capacity, but I'm happy to check with our team and see. Obviously, okay. there were briefings, as Marie mentioned, with Congress that were offered. Okay. And on those briefings, I would appreciate if you could uh, sure. take it. But on those briefings, um, I think the White House said that um, this was the program was fully debated by Congress. It was said last week that briefings were offered to members of Congress, mm -hmm. two different things. Um, I think it was said last week at this podium that, you know, if members of Congress didn't take advantage of the briefing, then, hey, that's not, you know, anything you all can do about mm -hmm. it. But the White House indicated that everybody was briefed on it. So do you know which it is? I'm not sure there's a difference. I mean, it's rare that any briefing everybody participates in, right? Um, so uh, I'm not sure I would... Ask, I would ask, of course, my, my former colleagues if they meant every person attended and they checked the box on attendance. I think they meant the same thing uh, we did over here, which is that um, briefings were offered to a broad array of members, and, and obviously all of them rarely participate in every briefing offered. Or debated. I mean, I think the words Carney used were fully debated in Congress. I mean, what does that mean to you? Uh, well, again, I know this was uh, discussed. I don't have any other detail really for you. I, I would also point you to um, USAID posted a blog post um, that just went up, I think, right before we came out here. So uh, that goes through point by point that may be useful to some of you who are following this story. Thank you. Sure. Can we go back to India? For sure. Minute? And then we'll go to Scott. I know several uh, State Department officials have met senior BJP leaders in the last six months. Was this issue of nuclear policy that BJP is putting up in his platform right now was discussed with them. Ambassador met, Deputy Secretary Burns met the BJP I just president. don't have any more details about those meetings. Obviously, we meet with a range of officials. Uh, that should come as no surprise. That's part of the job of any diplomat. Uh, but I don't have any more details about it. But you always discuss issues with them. Was this an issue when uh, you discussed? Again, I, I don't have any more details Can for you. Can you check out? I, I will, but I will probably have nothing to offer you. So I will uh, leave you with that expectation. Uh, let's go to the back uh, to Scott. Go ahead, Scott. In Nigeria, there are members of the military who have come forward with evidence that the Nigerian military itself is coordinating attacks with Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. Is the United States aware of these reports? Does the United States have any independent analysis of collusion between the Nigerian military and Boko Haram? How does that affect your helping the Nigerian mm -hmm. military with what you thought was a fight against Boko Haram? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let me check, Scott, with our team. I haven't had a chance to talk with them about this issue this morning or this uh, afternoon. A quick one on Egypt. Ahead, you started at the very mm -hmm. top. Uh, how did you make your displeasure known about uh, to the Egyptians about uh, the, uh, Muhammad Adil and Ahmed Mahdi? Did, did anyone speak with anyone there or just the state? We have an expansive team on the ground, okay. so uh, they certainly make their our concerns known when, when that is relevant. Same topic, sort of. Okay. Uh, Today's 100 days since the Al Jazeera English journalists mm -hmm. have been uh, in captivity. I'm just wondering if uh, you guys are in sure. touch at all with the Egyptians on that. Uh, well, we are, of course, watching closely uh, the trial and continue to convey our deep concerns directly to the government of Egypt. Uh, we urge the government to drop these charges and release these journalists who have been detained. We remain deeply concerned about the restrictions of freedom of expression in Egypt, including the targeting of Egyptian and foreign journalists simply for expressing their views. 
journalists, regardless of affiliation, should be protected and permitted uh, to do their jobs free from intimidation or fear of retribution. Egypt's constitution upholds these basic rights and freedoms, and Egypt's interim government has a responsibility to ensure uh, that they are protected. Thank you. One more on the sure. Egypt thing. Had you, um, I know you had previously urged the Egyptian authorities to reconsider the sentences on those three. Mm -hmm. Had you previously urged them to commute them? I'd have to check on that, Arshad, and see what language you would use previously. Because the reason, I mean, I can check too, but the reason I ask is I think there's one more legal appeal that mm -hmm. is still possible. Yep. <clears throat> and if you didn't ask them to commute it before, it suggests you've just given up on the legal process entirely or on the court process. Mm -hmm. uh, let me check with our team and see on that. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Oh, actually, can I ask about North Korea? Sure. Yeah, there was a trilat. Yes, uh, there was. So uh, I was just wondering if uh, during this uh, meeting, uh, the issue of a UN inquiry uh, that concluded that North Korea had committed crimes against humanity, did that come up? Well, uh, the trilat was happening this afternoon, and there were going to be follow-up meetings uh, with uh, Glenn Davies uh, immediately following it. So we're planning to release a readout uh, later this afternoon that will have more details. But it didn't start until after I was uh, coming down here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.